So uh, Jed and Julian have joined me this morning because uh, we decided we wanted to give a little a response video to the most recent conversation that uh, Paul Vanderclay had with Jonathan Peugeot. And um, I know that this conversation was very popular and well-liked, but we actually have a bit of issue with some of the things that were said in this conversation. Um, I want to start by saying that um, you know, uh, all of us uh, like and respect uh, Jonathan and Paul both and the work that they're doing. And we hope that they keep doing it. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes uh, we need others to point out where um, we might be, you know, saying something maybe we don't even mean, you know, if we thought about it more closely. So, um, um, and then I think hopefully we'll get to the end because I definitely have some more positive feedback, particularly for Paul toward the end of this conversation where I thought he, to be quite honest, my general take is like, he resisted. I mean, I'm sorry, Jonathan, I, I mean, not, I'm just, this is just an analogy, <laughs> but he, he resisted Satan. Like, Peugeot was very much, was very much uh, offering a temptation to John or to, to Paul to put money in my purse. And Iago is a type of Satan, folks. <laughs> uh, uh, to put money in my purse and to ride the status rocket. And Paul ends the conversation, toward the end of the conversation, Paul is like, no, actually, I'm interested in, in extending my pastoral building community. That's what Esther is about and tries to explain Estuary to Jonathan Pedro, who I'm not sure if he really still understands what's going on with Estuary, but he at least made a, up to his credit, he made an effort to try to understand it. So mm -hmm. it's not all negative feedback. So I wanted to start with a little bit of positive <laughs> feedback. Uh, before we got into some of like the areas where we um, might have some pushback. And I'm just gonna start by, I'm gonna just start, I'm gonna, the way I'm gonna do this is I'm just gonna play clips that we kind of talked about beforehand. And then um, I'll play the clip without commenting on, you know, or interrupting the, that particular clip. And then I will, well, I'll pause the clip and then I will, uh, um, we'll talk about how we feel about what we just listened to. <laughs> so let me, uh, Start sharing my screen. All right. And I have the first one loaded. Let me know if you guys are able to hear. Not fall into the religion of the. Everybody able to hear? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I'm going to continue playing. The crazy religion that is setting itself up because it's going to intensify. There's no doubt about it. Right? When Klaus Schwab's new book is called The Great Narrative. Can I? He knows it? exactly what's going on. They is there a comment already? Yeah, I just cannot stand when he uses that tone of this is inevitable. The pattern is playing itself out. There is no, like, I just see this so clearly. I Maybe I'm missing something, but it just, I, I just get triggered by that. I mean, is the, is, I don't know. Is do you get what I'm saying? Is it really yeah. that this yeah. sort of tone of oh, this is just inevitable and this is going to happen this way? And I think, yeah, I don't know. There's a way I actually agree with him on that point. Okay, let's hear it to a certain extent because it's like I think that the um, the Antichrist pattern is a cyclical pattern that is part of what we see in our reality, and it happens all the time. Um, and um, I think that there is a way in which, um, you know, um, globalism is an expression of that pattern. I think that's true. Um, well, I, I think that, I think what it fails, like, I kind of with Julian though, is like, there's a deeper structural failure in the thinking here mm -hmm. that, that seems to kind of vacillate between like well globalism is inevitable or nationalism is inevitable and like we see these kind of these false dualities that are at play that it's like well we do have a global society we do have that now we have to we live in that world so the idea that globalism is all bad it's like well that's the world we live in we have to learn how to how to manage and exist within uh within that 
setting in in, in a peaceful mm -hmm. and a peaceable way and so it's like the the constant like the idea that it's the evil globalists that are that are here like suffused with the spirit of antichrist trying to take over it's like well okay well, but, yeah, once I but just do you realize do you sorry. realize that on the other side of that the the antichrist principle is being fed from yes. the other side of the dialectic right. as well one type of antichrist principle but I, I just want to say that like in terms of like if you're saying that this shows a pattern of antichrist i think that's right but the problem is is that as we will see as we continue <laughs> He has a complete blind spot to another spirit of Antichrist that I, I have to say this, but I think he is. I think my brain just shuts down whenever somebody uses the word Antichrist. I mean, I think I get how you're using that word, but it, it just has too much resonance to be able to use to be able to be used in conversation, I think. If, if you know what I mean, it's sort of. What would you, out of curiosity, then, Julian? Like, what, uses it. That's why we're using it. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I, I'm interested, though, to hear kind of Julian, like, what do you, like, in understanding, like, how the term's being used, like, how would you, what would you say would be a, a better or more appropriate way to understand that? Because that's, a, I mean, I, I haven't heard uh -huh. that pushback before, and I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say there. Well, I guess. Um, I would see, I mean, I think I would, I would probably use the language of the powers, um, instead. Um, so I, I think the Antichrist is, so I would maybe talk about, um, how there's this certain power that this person is being, well, yeah, I would also makes me uncomfortable is just talking about a person as being uniquely captured by this spirit because that makes dialogue impossible it's, I mean, it's sort of, as soon as you say that it's sure that i see that's what i think i think that i i think the idea of thinking of like the, the antichrist as a literal particular person may not necessarily even be correct mm -hmm. well and I, I think that there's there's the um like i think the overall at least my my problem with kind of when we use antichrist terminology like oh it's got to be you know uh you know certain reading of eschatology but what we don't realize is how slippery of a character that <laughs> that really is like that it's like you could you can be accusing somebody else of being antichrist or or alignment with the powers and still be in service of the powers yourself you know, and, and that's, to me, that's the deeper question is like, oh, I feel, I feel vindicated in pointing this out that this person's antichrist. Okay, whatever. But like, what about your own thinking? You we know? all have the weed, weeds and the tears, right? Right, um, right. There's, it's there's like within our own thought, are, yeah, wait, with wait. our own thought, like, how are we, how are we advancing those interests? I suppose. If you, if you look at the way Hobbes describes like his conception like of the state and Leviathan, like it's a monstrous parody of the body of Christ mm -hmm. with an absolute monarch at its head. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Which and it's a and it's a cyclical repeating pat pattern. So Pharaoh was an Antichrist. <laughs> right? right? Pharaoh was an Antichrist. Hitler was yeah. an antichrist. Any totalitarian absolute jerk that's ever existed in history is reflecting the pattern of antichrist. The, the difference is, is that the, the, our current pattern, the technocratic globalist pattern of antichrist does it without the kind of, like usually that pattern involved the kind of like tap down, down coercion and now they just get you to enslave yourself. Which I think is, well, that's well, why, that's which, why which, that's, which is most, which makes it, which is why I can see why Peugeot thinks this might be an ultimate pattern of antichrist. Like, because now, because it has shifted where now the enslavement, like you enter into the enslavement willingly. Well, and I think that, but that, that's the deeper issue at play is that like, in a sense, we all concede to that power in as much as we are not viewing the cosmos through the lens of the cross right right we exactly. all do that exactly. because that's ultimately that's another way of thinking about and that's another valid way of thinking about antichrist by the way i think is actually just like 
you can really view everything as either Christ or Antichrist. <laughs> like you really can. I know Luke likes to say that a lot, and people are like, "What? What are you talking about?" <laughs> there's a way that he's that he's not. That, I mean, that's like ultimately, you're either in Christ or you're you're you're, or you're not. Yeah, and I think it's that that cruciform view of things that that well we'll get it i don't i don't want to get too far into i know we got more we've got like 30 <laughs> seconds into the video playing the first clip. <laughs> oh, let me let me go back and see i think we i don't know if we need to play the rest of that one because we kind of but let me go ahead just for like let me go ahead and play it and just in case there's some, some other thoughts they know exactly what's happening they understand that that story is coming back and that people need participation and they need sacraments. They won't use that word, but that's what that's what they ultimately are going towards. And so, and so we need a space in there that won't be, and that won't just be antichrist. <laughs> okay, so that's where that is the, it's the use of they, they and antichrist, yes. right? Is, is it, you're already like, if you want to look at it in like, Gerard sense you've already created the mimetic Correct. framework where yeah. you're going to mirror each other you don't need to raise your and hand, and you it's an interesting contrast hand. with what he does on at 5640 where they're talking about uh France and then he says um well what happened there is that they the people of France um kind of set themselves against the Catholic Church and they set up this us they relationship between the people and friends and he says well this us they relationship is is really um illusory because ultimately there is no they it's all we um we are you know and and it, i was just struck how he's deconstructing but we all do that, the, that's why I, this is why i want to be yeah I, I was I just to start by this is why i wanted to start by saying we like you jonathan <laughs> <laughs> and we think you're great i think yeah we do that all we all do all it day. we all do it we all fall into the same pattern and it's just like i mean honestly it's just like well and it's, it's the, the but it's that's a, to live out of a place where you're but julian's right i think that the like and it's the is that we we need to look at this as a we question not an us and them question yeah, that's exactly right and that it's a it's a much much more encompassing question when you're including yourself in it yes is is like i am under the question as well you know like like we were talking about with bart like you know in his romans commentary like we are under the question god's putting the question to us and it, it's a it's an encompassing thing and like what we like to do is we like to partition it into like this binary of us versus them because that leaves us feeling vindicated i have the truth they don't we need to overcome them and and i don't see that that again that's again not what's happening at the cross and it, so that's probably where i'll probably want to keep bringing it back to is like how how is that that kind of position and that kind of thinking how is that justified by a close reading of what's happening right, at calvary right it's, so, but it's, it's so very, difficult it's, to pull off sorry. isn't it right a lot of this is well a lot of this on Pat Joe is driven by his like understandably being upset about how you know draconian the covid restrictions are in quebec right okay yep. and yep. that's understandable and i sympathize and um, I know exactly where he's coming from and I get it. But if you contrast the way Paul Kingsnorth is talking about the same thing, where he humanizes and shows empathy for the people who have a different view than him, it's very, very different from the us, them kind of hard binary that Peugeot is setting up. Well, I, so I, I think, think Kingsnorth, I, Kingsnorth is managed, managing to speak to try to speak truth to the cultural moment from, but doing it from a place that is much more like centered in Christ, I think, because of the spirit in which he does it and the spirit in which you do things matters. I also think there is a difference is, and I think this is why I can listen to Kings North and COVID, but I can't listen to Peugeot and COVID is be, is because of the way they frame the issue. Um, right. Like when we were just heard in the clip, he was talking about this book by Klaus Schaub and then he says, they, and you get the sense that 
what he's referring to as they is this very specific cabal of people. It's a conspiracy theory. The elite. So he has this conspiratorial framing of it, but Kingsnord never, I don't think he talks about a they. He'll talk about the machine. Um, He'll talk about this kind of system in which uh, this kind of logic of um, prioritizing life as an abstract. But there doesn't need to be a human they, right? Because Paul's been talking about the the concept of egregores lately, right? So you don't even. And that's direct, that's why I'm even you wondering. Need, you don't even need the direct. You don't even need the direct involvement of the principalities and powers because egregores are a principality and power like phenomenon that is an emergent one that comes out of the collective thinking of groups of individuals. So Michael Martin actually talks about egregores quite a lot in his work and like one of the contexts that he talks about egregores the most is like corporate egregores right so you have like the egregore of monsanto for example which is definitely an egregore it's not a force for good in the world people (laughs) i guess this is where i'd like to bring this back to our discussion on antichrist like can you use antichrist language in a way that isn't conspiratorial where we're not talking about a specific they or a specific him but we're talking about um, this, this I, I think that's how we are using it. I think that, I power, think that there's a way system of logic the, Antichrist, the, the Antichrist somehow is a, so what the Antichrist represents. So the Antichrist is not a principality or power, right? So that means that we need to think about the Antichrist is, uh, is, is actually related to this idea. So he would be like the super egregore, like the egregore of egregores, right? That's what, that's what the, because it is, because the Antichrist principle is something that is emergent from within the human. Well, I think that that's where, like, you know, where, uh, you know, the second coming in the AIDS poem, like it's the spiritus mundi, right? It's, there's right. a, it's the, it's the, it's, it's, an, it is emergent. It's actually, it's actually us. Yeah, that's and actually, I think that's where the, the conspiratorial emergent, side like, of it, the conspiratorial like thinking. coming up at- <laughs> like, like out have of you, the fans. <laughs> have you guys watched any of um, Matt Chrisman's uh, Kush vlog videos? He's no. a he's a Marxist with, um, and he's on Chapo Trap House, their podcast. But he does these just these vlogs, and and he a, a year and a half maybe toward the beginning of COVID, um, he started talking about the demiurge principle as a Marxist materialist, which was kind of oh, rad. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like. In a sense, like we project those the conspiratorial darkness onto the other, right? Yes. The yes. right, the political right has a way of doing it. The political left has a way of doing it. But it's this, it, it, it's the, it's the diabolical principle of accusation, right? And and almost any of these conspiracy type things, there may be like grains of nuggets of things that may be loosely true in any conspiracy. But it's it's loaded with this whole this whole um, this whole paradigm that is I'm going to use an accusation or my perceived truth not in order to liberate but to destroy my enemy. Right. And there's a, there's the that that principle. It's like we, but we don't see that inside of ourselves. And so oftentimes, no, even when we exactly. think we have the truth, we're using the truth in a way that is in service of the lie. Yes. And in fact, is this is why this is why I this is why I almost never talk about politics, and unfortunately, I'm being forced to talk about politics to a certain degree because of the nature of the commentary on this video. But I try to avoid it because there's a certain extent to which, in any like, if you are engaging at all, like particularly in the on these virtual platforms, like any any engagement in, in this discussion at all actually is going to be in service of continuing the the world system that is under the influence of the principalities and powers, no matter which side you're on, if you're engaging in the fight, you're serving their ends because ultimately like that is their end. Yeah, it's, (laughs) it's, it's a tricky road to walk because I mean, I suppose someone could become convinced that, you know, there are these people out there who are intentionally um, working out this conspiracy. And in that case, um, they would be trying to speak the truth. Um, but I think mo- 
I don't know. I think I think the way this conversation is going with Peugeot here, he he's just sort of talking well, about a general right. symbolic it's pattern. You're talking about Pat, just sorry to interrupt, but like you were talking about Peugeot versus King North, King's North, and I think that's one of the differences between like King's North seems to understand that you don't you, you don't need to have any kind of cabal. Yeah to develop what's going on. Like, it doesn't have to be a conspiratorial cabal. Like, this, this this can happen without you going there. And so I think that's, like, that's the difference. Like, it's like, like, he wants to create a, Pajot seems to want to create a story of good guys and bad guys and a clear, clear black and white. And there's, like, a clear evil that we can fight. And this is clearly well, his orientation because if you look at, like, it's God's dog project, that's, like, um, I'm not so excited about that because it's emerging from with a very Dave's vault sort of kind of feel to it. Honestly, it emerges from us. It emerges from us, you know, and that's, I think the hard part about like the emergent property of the whole thing is like, it's easy to go to the conspiracy, harder to say that these realities exist in the architecture of our own spiritual reality right now. And, and that's where that's the, that's the hard part to this is where Peterson is better than Peugeot because Peterson seems to be, because of his union lens, he seems to be hyper aware of that, right? So he's like always like, he's always talking about the need to look for those potentialities within the self. And, and then, and he'll say things like, like in his Cambridge talk where he talked about like, you know, it's, I should, it's not about being right. And we need to reach across divides, of course. But then like the rest of us, this machine, <laughs> <laughs> that has been created, which is another great metaphor that Kings North uses, which is very much on the line with like Jacques Ellul's uh, notion of technique, right? Very, pretty much some very similar aligned ideas. Like we just are, we don't, we end up getting caught up in any way in, in spite of ourselves. Like, so the only way for Peterson to actually um, live out what he said is to stop raging on Twitter. <laughs> about everything well, and his, uh, his whole idea of like it, and some of away from his phone well some of that Jungian stuff too like I, and i'm not i i like Jung, um so i'm not anti-young but like some of the directions that peterson will take that in in terms of like becoming the monster you yeah in these I'm kinds not, of I'm things just, it's like it's like, there there is this acquiescence to again it's it's like it, it's this acquiescence to the very thing that we're ultimately like we're trying to overcome in the world we, we're trying to we're trying to we're trying to have a world where they're you know the monsters are no longer right. a threat you're supposed you know, to be the you're supposed are... to be becoming christ not the monster okay let's yeah. push back um here this is a question i have is i mean i, I i'm not sure if you can can you entirely live within this kind of always overcoming this us versus them dichotomy I mean, right. if, if, if you're like Peterson and if you're like, or, I mean, I, I think Peugeot and Peterson genuinely think there is a kind of right side to this culture war. Like they think this side is wrong, this side is right. And if I'm going to speak the truth and not lie, I need to be on this side of the issue. So, and I think that, I, I think that goes for most things. I mean, I don't think the truth is, is, I don't know um, how is, is in the money. middle. I don't think the truth is in the middle. I don't know how a thinking person can so, actually think that one side is entirely right and the other side is entirely wrong. Well, I think they, I would, really they would... Yeah, I don't know. I think, I don't know how they would exactly frame it, but... Um, no, I think you're right. I think they do think that. I do think that they think that. I think that they, they believe that there is a right side and they think they're standing up for the right side and they see it as a clear black and white and which is why they continue to fight the battle. But I don't think that, I don't think, I'm like, I'm neither woke nor anti-woke, you know? I'm not, like, I don't, like, it's not like. Which is like a classic Gen Xer thing to say, Nate. <laughs> yeah, I'm very, I just wonder, I, I just I wonder often if that's just a cop out, if that's just yeah. an easier path to walk than actually saying, okay, I disagree with you guys here here and here and you have this point right and this point right but right, yes. ultimately i think this side is that, more right that is what reaching across the divide this. would look like it wouldn't be like so instead of like just raging what you would be doing you like you would start by hey this is the actually the best way to do it is to start with i think that you've got this right mm -hmm. right 
would be to say would be to offer up to the person that you you think that you have a problem with you offer to offer up first i think you got this right which is like why we tried to start with this video with some positive praise like jonathan Pizzo has done a lot of wonderful things he has got a lot of stuff right i have been enriched by his work as have many others and um i this is not meant to be a takedown of jonathan Pizzo in any way go ahead i i think this is where this kind of meta symbolic structure kind of you know i think that's where, where it actually makes the conversation more difficult because if you think that there's a kind of okay um so there's this political movement uh, maybe you could call it wokeism or whatever and it has this intrinsic shape and structure and it's moving through history and it's just sweeping us all with it you're just seeing it from from a kind of 1000 foot view but you're never entering into the particulars and having those difficult dialogues and reading the books and, and thinking about all of the specific issues that this huge general principle um, is supposedly embodying. But I think well, that's where that, this kind of meta had, view yeah. breaks down. It's, it, it's kind of, we're in this very uncertain time and, and now we want this, this general system that just helps us navigate through. But but I think it, it just kind of um, bulldozes through the particulars where you, you're meeting a person face to face and you just say to him, well, you are embodying the Antichrist. You are right. part of this hegemonic system that's driving through history instead of having this very particular specific dialogue over the, 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 all of the range of issues. Um, that are being talked about here, right? I mean, no, it makes I, it, I, makes I, it I, really hard. It's is being used as a general term for discussions about feminism, about disability, about- Well, um, I think there's LGBT, a general- all the, And all of those are separate questions, right? I, I so- And part, well, of it is where, is, part of it is just built into the way he's using symbolism because although occasionally I've heard him say things like, like, like acknowledge that symbols are polyvalent, for example, like he doesn't actually, that's not how he acts. He acts as if this symbol must be interpreted in the way that he's seeing it, and there's no other possible interpretation of the symbol, right? Well, so, and part of I think, but and that and that breaking it down and giving people an answer, I think, is part of what drives his popularity. So, and I think we have a tendency to repeat the behaviors that we get positive feedback for from others. But, I mean, we're human, right? So, if, if that if that approach is giving it positive feedback, and it's like people are liking it, it's getting it more followers, whatever. I mean, it's very easy to get caught in that loop. But so I want, I wonder if you have like, like, like I have a, I have a Russian friend who's a semiotician who's like, you know, academically deals with symbols. Like, I wonder if like, if he were to, if he were to start a YouTube channel and like talk about symbols in a very complex nuanced way that was, that understood that symbols were polyvalent, like would he get, you know, 130,000 or whatever number of subscribers that Peugeot is up to? Probably not. Yeah, well, the, I think, and I, I wanted to kind of wheel back here to what Julian was talking about, about particularity, because I think that while I very much, I love symbolic thinking, but we have to also concede there is a weakness in sim symbolic analysis, right? Because it tends to generalize and it tends to abstract. And the particularity is where people live, you know, that's where people are. And so like, you know, and this was kind of the, the point of contention that I brought up with, with you, Nate, um, yesterday was like, I really don't see wokeism, whatever that is, as any significant threat to the church, right? And let me use an example. Right. And I, I, and I know within our community, I'm, I'm probably in a minority position here, but I am, I'm for LGBTQ inclusion within the church. And what has changed my mind on that are my Christian friends who are LGBTQ. Right. Right. Is seeing, seeing, the, seeing the, the living reality of their faith has, has left me to put the question to me years ago of, of whether or not I was I was trying to cram them into a universal into this symbolic understanding of what sexuality is, what personhood is, all these kinds of things. It doesn't mean that 
in every respect, I always agree with like the woke take on things because that's not true. But in, in these kinds of things where it's like we've otherized an entire group of people and have excluded them from the life of Christ on the basis that they don't fit within our understanding of the universal, because we can't come down at a particular level and, and contend with that. And I realize like I'm in a minority and, view in the group here on that, but I, that's, no, it's okay. and I, I want to drop no, no, one with the can of worms comment. Just open, then we're going to have to do a part two of this because we're going to be on this the rest of the time. I, I just okay. want well, one <laughs> little comment about what Jed just said. Um, and, and I think the big problem with this kind of talk of inevitability and there's this logic that's just going to play itself out and there's this great battle going on and, and if this side wins we're headed in this direction is that it shuts down those kinds of difficult particularized conversations yes where if i see this lgbtq person as being part of this logic that's moving us in this direction um and and all of this I don't need to have those conversations. I don't need to think about that. I don't need to struggle with that. I can just rest back in the fact that I'm on the right side of history and it's ultimately going to play out into my side. And I don't have to do the difficult work of unsettling my positions and having those conversations and being in that place of, I don't know what my position is on this, or um, I might have to change my position on this, or I, might have I to don't take think either side understands sexuality to start with, like, like right? So Illa, Illa, Illa listed uh, sexuality as like one of his plastic words, right? It's like <laughs> words that have, come, you know, been filled with like so much meaning that they end up like being so stretched that they just like have like no real meaning at all. Yeah, and I think that we so, like in one way or another, like where you land on on like this particular issue in the social sense. Now I'm speaking about this from a Christian, from the question of a Christian and, and really a cruciform vision is right. like, I think that, I think that the, the cross is inclusive of all, we're all there. And so we're all invited into that. And we're invited into that in our particularity. And we have to grapple with the consequences of what it means to be a person and how we conduct ourselves and comport ourselves as persons. Right. But like in the, in the way it, in the in the social debate over gender and LGBTQ issues is like we're, I feel like on both sides of the uh, of the equation is we're we're reinscribing a kind of the already fractitious nature of human sexuality, without really beginning to ask ourselves maybe the, right. the more meta and more trans trans. Right. But transcendental just, question of eroticism just to, push, just to push back on you a little bit a little bit and i'm totally like like i'm i have a very weird position on this because i actually just think that it actually has to be handled on a on a particular list personalist case by case basis or then churches through pastoral consultation that's how i actually feel about it i actually don't think churches should make bl blanket policies Whatsoever. Well, I think we do. We, I, we also think, do that, I also right? wait a minute. Just let me finish because I, I never got to the thing I actually want to say. So I don't think I also don't think it's like it's not right to ask the church to just like take whatever the culture has decided the meaning of this word that has become a plastic word is at the moment in this cultural moment. And it's like that is the truth. And the church just has to acquiesce to that and must bow the knee to that. I don't think that's right either. Just as it's absolutely wrong to like make such a ridiculous point of emphasis of excluding this particular group of people in the most absolute sense possible we're not making any move toward inclusion which is like I, which is like i kind of like like the weird dance like the people i think that get this the most right are people that do this like weird dance where you can't really figure out like where they stand on the issue like like pope francis who has said like lots of very seemingly contradict confusing things that have triggered both sides because he's trying to like be genuinely christian in his approach to the issue and if you're trying to be genuinely christian that's where you're going to end up like the same thing with rowan williams right it's like rowan williams is no longer archbishop of canterbury because like he basically angered both sides by like refusing to like by by abstaining from voting for a gay bishop we said he couldn't vote against because he thought he would be a good bishop but he said he couldn't vote for because 
Right. I and again, I, I, I get. I, I understand that, Nate, and I think like I appreciate the kind of the ironic um, ambivalence within that kind of a position. Right. That it's it's really the heart is like, hey, I, I don't want to I don't want to take a side on an issue. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, no, no, but no. I think... I'm saying that. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I, I think it's. A, I'm, what I'm saying is that well, taking a side is a trap. Well, it, it's a it, trap, it, and it's a trap. It was what we were just talking about earlier. It's a trap to 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 buy into an archonic us them right, game. Right. Right. But and, and, and to that's wrong, and to feed absolutely the wrong forces. And the, what we need to be focused on is the actual particulars of the person that we were talking about in that moment. So I think that. I actually think Rowan Williams, if he actually believed what he said about the character of that man and that he would make an excellent bishop, he did the wrong thing. He actually probably should have voted for him. Right. And so this is where I, and still, respect, kind of, I still respect like the, the nuance kind of view that Rowan Williams took over his career as Archbishop of Canterbury was a very like grounded, legitimate view. And his, and his The Body's Grace is one of the best pieces of theological writing that we have on this issue. Right. And so this is where I would push, I'd push back though on, and I agree that Rome, he should have voted for the bishop. I mean, I, I don't have a problem for that. If, if somebody's qualified, then they're qualified kind of issue. But um, I think we also have to be like historically cognizant enough that Christianity represents a, um, represents a side it represents a perspective it represents a it represents a kind of a a, a historical narrative see that's what Pesso is doing though like so, and, and and so good, and i think this is I a think, good place I, to I, move like, to the francis we're, to the saint francis we want to critique Pesso for doing that from his perspective which is obviously more conservative right like yeah. if we want to be able to legitimately critique that we can't do that while at the same time saying no actually christianity is about this side and then it, take, and it's not that's not and, and, and see that's side. where yeah and i i think that i think that julian's right we definitely wanted to jump on but I, i'll i'll leave i'll leave just my own perspective on this question here at this is that we have kind of represented a, a, a cultural phenomenon on a side of culture right we have that's and i'm saying we have to be realistic that that has been the reality so to be ambivalent on questions that ultimately lead to and for me it's a this is a question that does still center on the cross is right. who's included and on what basis right and so and and who's excluded ultimately, and so to me is, ultimately everyone is included but how, but 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 how and when and, and that inclusion happens is still like, right, and I, I that's a big that's a that's a much more in depth discussion. But my my approach true. is that that is that in because of the particularity. If you sit down, if I were to sit down they with have one to of be my included through, but, but Jack, here's what, I just one of my gay on. Christian friends, like I'll sit down yeah. and have this conversation with a gay Christian friend, and the question is going to be, I get what you're saying, I get that you want to be loving, I get that you're wanting to be kind and to deal with this at a particular issue, but when you're speaking with them. In, in a real life, honest, like they're sharing their life experience with you. And you realize that there are also structural elements that reflect things that, that are ultimately exclude them, right? Is, is I think, I mean, I, I, I'm of the personal opinion that we need to rethink a lot of these things. And I, I do think that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna push that here, but, um, but I do think that like when you when you get into the particularity and you humanize people, you allow them to be who and what they are, that the calculus of these conversations changes a lot. And and the the prioritization for me from my own Christian particularity has driven me more to that that uh, Christocentric cruciform vision. But what do you Jed, I mean, you can't ignore like you, you can't talk about this issue and ignore what that means for the sacrament of marriage. Yeah, I and I I think that and, I think that there's no I think there's no way around that. But I mean, like I said, I mean I, I I'm with so I think, I'm worshiping a, I in a pretty that, progressive. Like, I actually think here's the thing. It's like I, for me, it's like like I have like I don't I have a problem with that. Like almost on an ontological issue. Like if you like like 
I just don't think that I don't think the sacrament of marriage being uh, a man and a woman is something that like we have the authority to alter. I just don't. Like yeah, that's no, like I... like that's like Genesis. <laughs> like it's right. Not so the beginning. So I mean that's a that that's an interesting. Like I, I think that that's an interesting. Compassion. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not about excluding people who, who are gay from Christian worship at the same time. Like I, right. I, and, I, I know that's and a very I, strange position to have. I mean, I don't, I don't really know anybody else who has that position. Right, and and, and I, I'm not here to like take on that whole discussion here, except for one, I, I am not, uh, you know, I'm not of the opinion that marriage is sacramental <laughs> right, and, I am. <laughs> and so um so i i think that i think okay. that, that I makes think a that big difference right and I, do. I think this is such a bigger it's a bigger issue obviously it is a bigger issue and, and, and I, I it's not one I, I i want to resolve but I, I i do think that like the question of you know i think that we're like oftentimes what the church has fallen into the trap of is placing these ontological questions down at the level of our physical morphology, sexuality, these kinds of questions. And really, I think that the question of ontology for Christians has to be the question of what is in Christ, right? What does it mean to be in Christ? Right. And then how does being in Christ inform how you, how we live both collectively and then as particular persons. And so um, so I'm going to approach that issue from a very different angle than, let's say, um, you know, like the, the big traditions in Christianity that are going to want to sacramentalize this. It wasn't marriage wasn't viewed as a sacrament in the early church. It wasn't it wasn't even, you know, kind of canonized as a sacrament till, till later on. And the development of what that looks like as a social convention, I, I, I look at it as as an important social convention that is loaded with symbolic it's a, no, it's a and spiritual significance. You will actually, I think if you destroy that, you actually will destroy any possible, any possibility but of it's, any co co cohesive, coherent okay. culture at all. We need right, to put a pin in this and, and move on. That's, that's the we basis are, of the family. We're going to have to have another so if conversation. You attack, if you attack that, <laughs> you're, you're attacking the, basis, the, very, the very basis of foundation of the family. And I think the church is a family. And that those those typologies like have huge meaning for the church. They just do. right. I just don't. I just don't see so, those things as a, as a fundamental. Like I don't see gay marriage as a threat to the traditional family. I just don't see it there. I don't see. I don't marriage, see it there. There. Secular gay marriage? Absolutely not. I'm not against secular gay marriage. Right. But sacramental gay marriage is absolutely a threat. Right. And, 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 and I don't. The church. The church is what holds everything together. I don't care about the state. The state doesn't matter. The state is no. possessed by it. the state. Will always be under the control of Satan. Period. There's no taming it. There's no making it better. You can't make it plain eyes with the church. That's a mistake. That's the mistake Pesho is making. Okay, but you destroy the church. Like that's what I, yeah. the church together. It's the foundation I, of it. And, and I mean, I'm just. It, I'm a part of a church family where that's just, it's just not like, I, I get the, I get the, the, the fear of that, but I just, I don't see that at play in my communities. And so it's like, it's hard to, it's hard to like wrap my head around the idea that like, but anyway, I, I'm with Julian. I'm, I'm cool with moving into further into the discussion because we could, <laughs> Nate and I could, we could go back and forth on this for. No, it's, it's absolutely I, fascinating. I, I, and, and I think this would, yeah, it, it's a fascinating well, conversation, but um, you you guys could talk about this for hours. For, uh, forever. <laughs> That's why I said, but yes, exactly. It's just like, it's because we're like, we have, I like, I have, a, I understand, like, I'm more sympathetic to where Jed is coming from than, than most people who would like draw the same hard line that I'm drawing because like, well, for one thing, it's like, to me, it's not like, I mean, I have, I have, a, I have a gay daughter, right? I have, my, my dad is gay. I have an aunt who's gay. It's not like mm -hmm. to me. It's not. It's not something. It's. It is particularized for me. It does. Yeah. I mean, it does yeah. have particularized meaning in my life. And yeah. I do. And I do. Like I have gay people in my life who I love, right? And if they, and none of them happen to be Christian, but if they were Christian, I would be glad that they were Christian. And I would say, here's the thing. To me, the other thing, Jed, is like I also really believe in. I really seriously believe in 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 
the compatibility of unity and multiplicity. So the problem I have is like, if you want, if, if you're, if you're a gay Christian and you love Christ, then just find a church that is already affirming. Yeah. Don't well, try to, like, you're not, there's nothing Christ-like about trying to alter a church that is not, that has, and, and that conservatives don't have no reason for wanting to draw that line, that they're like, there's, there's, there, there's something real that they're standing for there. And I don't think that at this point where we stand in history, we actually understand what the consequences might be if like every church just gave into the cultural zeitgeist in the moment and said, okay, let's just, you know, let's throw out sacramental marriage and just be affirming. And I think like part of this has to do with like, like the, the whole sacramental marriage thing, which is, is kind of key here. And Protestants are kind of, as far as I can tell, because they don't have sacramental marriage, as far as I can tell, they're kind of they'll have to eventually, I don't see what they have to stand on, honestly. Because to me, that's like, that's like kind of like the only like ultimate line of defense. Right, and, and, and I, I think to try to connect this to, to some of the, the issues that Peugeot and, and, and uh, Paul Vanderclair are, are dealing with is that, um, you know, the question, the question to me of how how we connect some of the big universal type questions to the particular right yeah. is is it is that we can't we cannot assume and i i feel like this is it, it so many conversations go this way is we assume the easy answer we assume that like in stating our position that we understand the implications of what our positions are Right. And I'm not, well, I'm not doing that for sure. I'm, 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 I'm actually making, giving a very uncomfortable answer. Hello. Oh, we cut off. We lost Nate there. Julian, we're, we're staging a takeover of the whole conversation now. <laughs> I, I find this, this really fascinating because this is, this is an issue I'm, I'm kind of uh, wrestling through and, and I don't have, um, yeah, I, I won't say that I am settled in one position or the other. But, um, right. And, and, I, and I'm not here to like, I'm not here to like evangelize. I appreciate, that, I appreciate point. hearing your perspective. No, Jed, you um, made a I, really powerful I'm, case. I'm yeah. very sympathetic to it. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but, but my bigger, but I think it's illustrative of the way that we, like, again, the question of what, what is like, how much of like, you could get into the question of continuity and discontinuity between the eschatological life and the earthly life because we're kind of leaning as, as, as an episcopal marriage is still a church sacrament even though it's not like i'm not a member not a <laughs> <laughs> okay you're not a member can i okay, okay. can i um draw a contrast here um i wonder I, I i've been thinking about this and i'd like to run it past you guys um i wonder if for peugeot christianity is about logos but for me Christianity is about liberation. It's about freedom. And I wonder mm -hmm. if that draws a contrast where Peugeot sees Christianity as the structure of reality, as the kind of great code of um, that sort of underlies, it's the sort of, um, I don't know, DNA of, of creation. It's the kind of um, the structure that holds everything together. And I see Christianity as the way, um, the way of freedom um, in the midst of this, this kind of world of, of competing powers and, um, and forces. Jesus opens up the way of freedom of, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, I don't know. And I'd be interested to hear both of you describe what do you think? I Christianity is ultimately about is it about logos or is it about freedom and and does that connect with the disagreement you're having about um this issue hmm. or is that a bad taxonomy I don't know no I think I think that it's an interesting taxonomy because I think that we it's I think some of these like there's no way you can't import psychology into this like we all kind of have our own um kind of psychological tracks we're most comfortable traveling on and I think that that logocentric track that that Peugeot is looking at, like there is appeal to it because I think there is a there is kind of a source code reality to Christ as logos, 
that that encompasses the whole structure, right? But I also think that like we still exist in in a world in the midst of powers that are um, antichrist in nature, right? That are yep. they're leading us away from that path of liberation into further bondage. Right. And, and I'm not and, using and, liberation in a way to say obviously like the sort of libertarian just go do what you want that's the opposite of it that's kept i almost heard it in, i almost heard it in like a taoist key like when you're saying that he's the way you know is like oh. there there's a sense where when i was hearing you talk about it it's like there's no this is the path of liberation well the, the, yes and i think that there's that the, that side of it like to me there's a there's a deep appeal into that because one way or the other we live in a world where however you want to construe those powers they are ensnaring and they're enslaving and you feel the weight of them in your daily life every day you feel their presence in, in media in 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 uh, just the mode of our culture all those kinds of things but then jesus holds out a, a way that in a sense the the cross kind of blows that whole thing up and says there's a whole different way of being that is available to you now that previously may have seemed completely impossible but it, it the cross does liberate us from that from the the structure of reality as we currently experience it and i so i yeah i mean there is a sense julian i think well well i i i find the, the logocentric appealing i'm probably more with you on the liberation aspect of it in terms of just what about the message of jesus that to me resonates most deeply it's like, of course, he's the structure of reality, but what does that mean I think for me existentially? About the same thing, though. Yeah, and I don't think let's they're into the same thing. One of the other ways of thinking about logos, <laughs> like, so logos is like the two ways of thinking about logos is one, one is meaning, but the other way of thinking about logos is center, right? So, mm. which is, and that, that, that logos is center is like, I think that's related to the idea of like, like the Sabbath peace, which is like what happens when you're living out of like a christian freedom right which is like by being in christ <laughs> which brings that peace which is i mean which is the other reason why <laughs> i have a problem with that show because who's who has an antichristic false peace on offer well that would be caesar like that's like literally like it's like the peace of caesar is a counterfeit offering to christ and the, the the peace of caesar is ironically like founded on like a monopoly of violence that depends on perpetuating violence in order for it to continue to exist mm -hmm. if the violence stopped then it would have no justification for its own existence so it has no it has it has every vested interest and continuing to foment violence either against foreign and for enemies foreign or domestic so yeah yeah I'm, I'm interested i got i've got about 30 minutes and i've got a hot brunch date with my daughter um awesome. so uh um but I, I would like to get into that uh saint francis um yeah let's do that let's try to like yeah we like and we'll definitely we'll have to do a part two because we had not spent so much time on that but you know we've been talking about talking about that for a while so it needed to happen so. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to do it yeah it'll definitely let me play the Frank, saint francis clip let me let me, get, let me get it copied and pasted here then i'll try to shut up until he finishes talking this <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to share yet. I actually have to get it. Get it set up. The other one loaded. <laughs> tells his sister, if you don't okay, there we go. Let me just like rewind a little bit. Okay. And now I can share. All right, here we go. Yeah. Uh there's a great there's a great quote about that in Fanny and Zoe by JD Salinger, where the 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 protagonist tells his sister, it's like you don't know anything about Jesus. You're basically it's basically Francis of Assisi. You think Jesus is Francis of Assisi. And it's like Jesus is not Francis of Assisi. Like Francis of Assisi is good, but Jesus is not Francis of Assisi. Like he has he has many other aspects about him, let's say. Yeah. 
He has He's many other aspects about him. That's the key phrase there, isn't it? Yeah, right there. That's why I stopped it there. What does that mean? I think he's 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 getting at this logos thing. Um, man, I don't know. I I I I um, am I muted? Yeah, I'm. I had another dichotomy set up here where you can think of. Oh, go ahead. You can think of. Hmm. So I think. I, and I'm not comfortable with this. I was thinking about this. I think this is at least how Peugeot would characterize it. He would say, you can think of Christianity as the logos, or you can think of Christianity as the ideology. And in this case, thinking of Jesus as St. Francis would turn Christianity into an ideology where you're taking one aspect of this cosmic Christ and saying, this is all there is to it. Um, and but, but and I'm not I, I don't know if I could buy that because I think is that, is I think that a failure of trinitarian thinking though. Well, let, let me just um, say a few more things. Like I think, you know, as as the kind of Christian as a, that I am, as a sort of Anabaptist Hutterite, I think, you know, the way of Christ is embodied in pacifism, in um, community of goods, and, and 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 that doesn't mean I think all of the Christians who don't embody that are, you know, are sort of outside of the kingdom of God. But I think this is what the way of Christ is all about. So does that, so, so in a way, I think, I think Jesus no, is, totally is, 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 Saint, is like St. Francis. If I was more aligned theologically with the Hutterites, I'd be, I'd come join your community, your community like tomorrow, <laughs> like seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, in terms of the way you're living as, as being the vision of the way Christian, the, the, the Christianity should be, I 100% agree. In the abstract, yeah. Well, yeah. Julian, what did you like? What do you feel like in terms of kind of setting up kind of this Jesus Francis dichotomy, right? And kind of he piggybacks off of Salinger, which is interesting. Um, but what do you what do you feel like? What do you feel like is problematic there? What do you feel like he? I, I see where he's going with it, but I, I'm interested to see like what what is it that you see at this at the heart of okay, this is this is I, missing a, something. I think it comes back to the conversation over whether Jesus is radical and whether he's revolutionary, or whether he represents the kind of cosmic structure of reality. Which I don't. Maybe that's true at the same time, but. Um, <laughs> I well, yes because, yeah but I don't know does that make sense at the same time because it's the cosmic structure of reality it's not the reality that is instantiated here on the earth because the earth is under the rule of the principalities and powers it's, it's it, Satan has dominion but he keeps ignoring that fact well he ignores that fact because essentially like the kind of like the branch of orthodoxy he comes from seems to not believe that. Mm. Um, which that that became clear to, clear to me within the um, the Father Stricken conversation. I know that this is not universally true of all Orthodox because for like Bogakov, for example, like clearly associates the 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 the, 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 the state with the forces of the beast. Like there's a one to one correspondence, and um, Bogakov's political thinking is all about enchurchments, like the enchurchment of society. Here. Here is, is where I often um, wonder if, if I disagree with Peugeot is when he talks about the cross. Yeah, and he I describes know. Jesus going to the cross and he says he has the crown of thorn, thorn, thorns on his head and he's naked. And, and so he's kind of presented as both the king and the thief. And I fundamentally disagree with the move he makes there. He says... So this is establishing the top of the hierarchy and the bottom of the hierarchy. But from my understanding, what's happening there is a redefinition of power. He's saying the king is the thief on the slave. And what true power looks like is this moving down, this um, lowering of oneself, this, this renunciation of power. Um, right. and, I, and I think this, this connects then to pacifism and this connects to and, and, and so ultimately, I think Christ does take a position on these things. He takes a position on whether we should be pacifists or not. He takes a position on whether we should be 
um, communists or not, or on whether we should be um, renouncing power or not. Uh, on whether, and, and so I think Jesus is an ideologue and not the structure of reality, if that matters. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, there's a there's so much there, Julian. That I, I, like really for well, me, there's a, there's a res reality because he's God. So you can't deny that. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I, I, that's I don't the think. First thing I said was like, but, but that's this is but this is also this is this is actually tied to my critique because my critique of what Pajot was suggesting is like there's a breakdown of trinitarian thinking because he's wanting to think about like Jesus like Jesus as the as as the human only right he's really only talking about the human Jesus when he says that when he makes that comparison because mm. when you think about when you, when you think about Jesus like as like the divine son that's part of the the holy trinity whose essence very essence is love right then actually um, him and St. Francis are participating in the same ultimate fundamental reality. And it turns like Jesus is that. So whatever, so whatever Francis, whatever Francis represents of that is nothing compared to what Jesus represents that because Jesus is, that is his very essence. Yeah. As as part of the as part of the uh, of, of the of the Godhead, like that's that's just he is the embodiment of that. Well, and I think that that's where like like what Julian like the like where where we have struggled historically as Christians is to see the radicality and the revolutionary aspect of what God's disclosure in Christ is actually representing. I mean, you know, the the perverse contrarian in me sees it, sees the cross as the act of cosmic rebellion, right? <laughs> is that it? It's it is the it is the upending of the old order entirely, and yes. in a in, in an exposure of that order. And so, what what is curious to me, and this is just a historical phenomenon. This is not, you know, Peugeot is at the you know at the very end of this process right that we are all kind of at the end of this process but it's like kind of like trying to use christ to reinforce the social order when it's actually the social order itself that has been called into question is like well christ is is the is the substance of reality then the question is what reality which reality because I, my question is i don't think we live in reality <laughs> if if Christ is the reality, is the structure of reality, and yet, are... and yet Christ, yeah, and yet Christ, and, and, and it was, and you, it was wonderful when you had your little video on your own journey to universalism. You, you focused on on the moment where where Jesus where Jesus says, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." Right. So it's right. like even though he's like, so there's no like even even in, even in like completely showing how our idea of power is wrong and that it turns out that love and ultimate sacrifice are power and not what we call power like even while he's doing that he does he does it while still forgiving like just further demonstrating the truth of that yeah yeah and that's the that's exactly the point that like i think that the radicality like you know we have to begin I, I think what happens is like is the the my concern with like the kind of the reification of the symbolic order okay cool that's awesome and i i like that you know i like that about peugeot but if it if we're if we're kind of revitalizing the symbolic order and this enchanted world in a way that is in service of kind of that archonic structure of the world that's already that's present. See, Jedediah, what, what's that's happening right. here is that you're 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 this kind of woke other side that he's ultimately resisting. So that's what you would say. Yeah, and and <laughs> and I, to me, it's like well, those categories like they just don't they don't ultimately obtain because if we like, you know, so Jesus comes into an enchanted world that is completely enchained to its enchantment like we're chained to our disenchantment but 
it, they're chains nonetheless. And he's he's breaking that he's he's liberating us from that reality, and the and it, it, it's that radical liberation that is able to in in the very act of of submitting himself to the cross, Christ has exposed the problem of politics, the problem of religion, the problem of debt, the problem of poverty, the problem of power. He's he's exposing all of these as problems in our world. But, and it, it, it what in and, and in going towards like well we need to kind of hold this world together is it robs us of that apocalyptic Where, imagination. So, so and I, I want to stick with this. So give me a second. I mean, give me a second here. Is that the apocalyptic imagination that the world can actually be different? That that the world that Christ is introducing us to is radically different, and it is it is the task for us to attain as opposed to acquiescing to these old structural models that will only ever produce repression, oppression, and ultimately misery. That's what we're being liberated from. And, and the idea that we can stay within those structures, it, it tells me that we lack the imagination to see the world in a different way. We lack grace. We ultimately lack grace. Grace is this new possibility which opens up what would be impossible under the old structure, under the old Adam, under flesh, under the order of the kingdoms of this world. Grace is the new possibility of the kingdom of God, which makes possible what is impossible. Um, and, and that's and you see, where is grace and revelation like and the breaking the... in of something new in Peugeot's symbolic order. It's like this order has stood there from, from all eternity and now Jesus comes to reify it and to reestablish it and to show us the clearest, the, just to um, sort of show us this symbolic order in all its splendor. But I see Christ coming into this uh, world of competing forces and powers and economic structures and religious structures and political mm -hmm. powers. And he opens us up in, into the Trinitarian life of the kingdom of God so that it's possible for us to exist under these structures of dominion, but to be in this free new relationality of the kingdom of God to sort of move underneath these powers and to sort of weave this new world of the resurrection within the old. I think that's what's happening. And, and, and you're, is that kind of what you're in a sense, are you summarizing? I mean, I love what you're saying. Is that just kind of a summary of like this Hutterite. What I would say, what he, would ult what he was ultimately doing was make it possible for us to see what was always there. Well, and, I don't know. And, is he? Well, maybe he is. Maybe he's not. I don't know. That's what I wonder. Well, I think what that, is that's the continuation the, between the old and the new. That's the profound that's side why, of like the Hutterite. Why, that's why the bondage. That's why the. I think that's why the bondage metaphor is used so often, right? It's like that. It's it's the bond. The bondage. Well, and also like blindness, right? Like it really is about seeing, but. There's a way in which the event of the 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 event at Golgotha like makes it pop make it, it it opens up the possibility to see it, but it's not but it but it's an eternal event. Ultimately, it's it's no different than the moment of creation. To be honest with you, it's just that we got ourselves into a place where we cease to be able to see reality which is why i think the matrix is such a powerful metaphor because that's essentially what the world that's what the what the world of the principalities and powers is is an illusion it's it's it's, it's the matrix the kingdom is what's real yeah and now right. we're able to see it well and i think that some of those things that julian that you're talking about is like that seems to me to be like what like the hutterite spirituality is emblematic of is to is that existing within the the structures of this world but as liberated as a liberated community it's not just the liberated individual and i think that that's where you know yes. it's hard to be I, integrated in in our societies in a way that allows us to you know to in a sense you guys are living the impossible and showing that it's possible like that this well, this kind of life is possible and it it, it it is it's it's available and attainable but it, in a sense you have to you have to let go of the structures. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know. I think, I think it's ultimately a, a, a kind of spiritual reality. It's a spiritual freedom. It's, it's a, it's being drawn into the Trinitarian life of God. And, and I, I see it as sort of this 
and, and so that's why I don't think it necessarily has to play out in this kind of separate community like the Hutterites. I see mm-hmm. this as a kind of network that's possible within any kind of structure. It, mm-hmm. It's the, this forging of friendships and connections, which, which, which are sort of a reality that, that's underneath the, the existing one. Right. One of the debated um, translations of the kingdom of God is within you, which, which of course was the among, Tolstoy's uh, seminal work in, on Christian anarchism is that it's among you, right? And I think that actually is probably right, especially oh. especially when because that also makes you understand why Christ says wherever two or three are gathered in my name. That's like, that's the presence of the kingdom, folks. Like that is like, even if it's just that, like you, like, like, if you are, if, if there is alignment with the spirit of Christ, <laughs> any, any community, like, even if it's only two or three people. And if, and if, if there isn't alignment with the spirit of Christ, I think any, any community, community, you know, how, no matter how anarchic and, and kind of separate from the, how, no matter how radically it tries to separate itself from the, from the political structures and economic structures of the world, it's not going to be this kind of genuine freedom. It's going to get caught up in a different logic. So it, I think it's only the the Trinitarian power of God which ultimately frees us from 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 the, these these alienating forces. Well, if you look at it, Julian, like I mean, you can look at, you can look at history. That makes sense. And there's like you can mm-hmm. see that the only the only like long term successful like uh, communal living structures all are explicitly faith based. Like they're all they're all like. I mean, you, your your community is a perfect example. The um, kibbutz is. You also have the kibbutz. Yes, that's exactly yeah. where I was going. Yeah. You said it before, maybe, but yes, the kibbutz is in Israel. It's like so, like, and whereas, like the the communes that formed in the '60s around just you know secular ideas only all collapse very quickly. So yeah, well, there's something to, too uh, that I that kind of just this phrase that popped in my head that. Like I think, like the the concept of like a subversive presence. Yep. Like mm-hmm. the, the 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 church is always in Christianity is always been at its best in the world when it's a subversive presence. Right. Like is not the not the presence that you know that baptizes the powers that be, but the no. the, the presence that calls those powers that be into question the, themselves. The presence it that often is that despite itself. The presence that was so powerful <laughs> that it com- that 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 it that it made itself appealing to the powers that be, so that the powers that be wanted to be joined to it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that. Was. And I think that that's where, that's where that was like the maybe our fall from Eden, <laughs> like in terms of you know we we kind of we allowed ourselves to be seduced by but that kind of power to our our early for christian forebearers it's like there's no way that like you know a, that as a church that have been living under like you know persecution all this time that there's no way you would not see this as a blessing and the oh yeah for sure and the hand of god operating in history there's no way you sure. would but and we can only make that call in judgment from the vantage point of history, right? We can right. only look at that historically and say, well, maybe this didn't get us to where we. What uh, I don't understand is is what I don't understand. Even though I have like I'm not I'm not absolutely critical of Constantine. I don't think that Constantine is this absolute diabolical figure that ruined everything. Neither do I think that like like this move to like say Constantine fixed everything has any historical validity whatsoever. I don't understand how you're reading history. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, we should move on. Do we have time for one more little segment? I think you guys wanted to discuss the money section. We could quickly jump to that. We're not going to out of time. (laughs) (laughs) Otherwise, it's going to be an embarrassing six minutes of commentary that we that we covered. We yeah, could just cover the first yeah, six minutes. It's hard too. Well, it really, it was really most of the stuff that we wanted to give some like constructive criticism about was within the first ten minutes. So it's actually not too bad. So we might actually only need a second part. So um, is there any like final observation that anybody wanted to offer, or like something? Is, is, does somebody want to say one final nice thing? 
Well, this, I, I, yeah, I, I think that with Paul, okay. like with Paul, especially like, I think that his, um, you know, like the idea that, that Jonathan brought up of like, you know, money being able to extend, use money to extend oneself, right? Is that Paul is, has done a, a really interesting job with estuary and everything that he's worked on is that this is not a, there's not an economic driver behind this is that it's just, it, it's, it's one man's personal love for Jesus and to see that replicated and shared in the lives of others and spread and seeing it spread that that's the extension it's the it's the christ in me that is extended it's not the it's not the me and the you know my my platform my work my this that and i, and I, I really appreciated I'm that about, about that i think that's something he might want to walk back because like there's no like extension of the self is not something to be desired i i'm actually not <laughs> quite sure about I'm, I'm not sure if I follow the critique here because I took Peugeot to be saying that he has all of these wonderful ideas about what to do with his projects in the symbolic world and having more resources makes it possible for him to do that. Um, yeah, and I think that at the, if, if that's where he was, I think it was just yeah, when he said the, the money. Really when he said that, I was like, yeah, that's totally that's fine. fine. I, I think it's just the idea that like it's that the money is what is enabling that. So like I would say like, no, Jonathan, like let's peel the layers back here of where this comes from was when I was hearing him describe like the years and years of discussion that him and his brother had had about these kinds yeah, of things. And when he talked about like, that's, like, like coming out of poverty and like finally finding some modicum of success, it's like, yay for you, Jonathan, you deserve it. You're doing great stuff. That's all fine. But what's being extended is that, is that years of work, it's years of thought and so study and growth. This, that's what's being money, extended. But validating yeah. the cultural okay. notion that money yeah. is power was not like, that's what I'm saying. I think that like, I think if he would have had a chance to think about what he was saying more carefully, he might want to walk that back. A yeah. Bit. I, I didn't think that it was like, I don't think that's like was indicative of what he really thinks. He has like fairly dark ultimate associations. Yeah. Cause I think that like, you're, you're advocating the extension of the spirit of mammon instead of <laughs> instead of christ i mean that's what you're doing um so ultimately money isn't power so well it is if you're if you operate within that framework and i think that's kind of the the, the question is like well the the real spiritual power in Peugeot's work, and right. I think there is it's there. Power, right? Where so, well, where is that coming from? It's not coming from the fact that he's bringing money in now. It's come from the years of development. It's correct. come from the it's come from the deep set of spiritual convictions. It's like, well, the 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 resources and all those things, those kind of those can be helpful in terms of putting more work out there and putting putting more work together, and that's cool. Like I'm not anti resource kind of guy or you know anti money, but it, the idea that it's, you know, that that's what's enabling him to uh, see his ideas grow and flourish in the world. Like I would challenge that. I mean, and Paul would be just the primary challenges. It's not, not like Paul's sitting there, you know, trying to get people to donate to him and, and those kinds of things. It's just, and some people do because they like, they see what Paul's doing yeah, and they believe in that. Patreon. Yeah. So, and that's, and that's a really a wonderful thing, you know, and it's good that it helps Paul out with his ministry and also what he, what he does. But I just, I think that the challenge is just it's easy thinking for us all to slip into that in terms of, you know, the kingdom is that is the loaves and fishes is the principle of multiplication and extension. But it, it's coming from that vital spiritual connection. And we don't want to the pushback I would give to Peugeot there. And I don't think I doubt that he would disagree with this very much because he doesn't strike me as like a greedy guy or you know, some money grubbing capitalist no, or anything just, like that. It's just it was an unfortunate thing. It was yeah. an unfortunate thing for him to say. Yeah, and I, I think that it's just more of like, Jonathan, like the real power in your work has nothing to do with the money, right? Yeah. And also like the idea of it being an extension of your body, because to me, that's like, that's really not good because like, to me, like the ultimate, the ultimate example that we have of extension of body is like the words of consecration, right? Mm -hmm. where, 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 you know, uh, um, Christ expresses like the cosmic nature of his body. Um, and like, that's like, so to me, to tie that idea of bodily extension to money is a problem. 
for that reason because it's like no <laughs> i know what he means i know what he means but he should have found a there's there, there there would have been a better way to say it without making that kind of linking yeah oh um, all right any yep last word julian go for it oh i was just going to say i have to jump off um oh, okay. i have a last word i don't want to be um yeah i think i think i yeah i was happy with um I I I wouldn't want to characterize this as my critique of, of of Peugeot because I wouldn't be so presumptuous. But I think I was able to articulate where I disagree with him at least, um, where I see things differently, and I wonder if if the disagreement is ultimately um, insurmountable or if there's a way to. No, I don't think it is things. because I've heard Peugeot like some of the very things that you say. I've heard come out of Pajot's mouth too. So like, it's not like, it's not like Pajot would like, I don't think Pajot would fundamentally disagree with a lot of the things you're saying. There are some things where he would disagree about, but I think that's like, you know, I mean, I mean, hopefully this is seen in the, in the spirit of constructive criticism. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's how we intended it. So yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for, thanks for talking. joining me. That was really, really great. You know, we have the, 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 the pre-conversation was <laughs> also very good too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Nice meeting you, Jed. We should definitely connect sometime. Absolutely, Julian. Sounds great.